Welcome to Codex. Um, Afonso Bandera is a professor of mathematics at ETH Zurich. He studied with Amit Singer at Princeton University until receiving his PhD in 2015. He worked at both MIT and NYU before starting his current position in 2019. Professor Bandera has received numerous awards, including a 2018 Sloan Research Fellowship and the 2020 Stephen Smale Prize. His research revolves around the mathematics of data science with a focus on interactions between probability, optimization, and computational hardness. And today, Afonso will be treating us with a talk following those themes. Uh, take it away. Hi. Thanks, Dustin. Thanks so much for the invitation. And thanks for, for the kind introduction. And, uh, and thank you all for coming. So I'll, as Dustin said, I work in, uh, in sort of in a very broad sense in mathematics of data. And lately, what I've been most interested in is in understanding what, what, uh, what barriers this compu can computation uh, uh, create uh, in learning or in statistical estimation. So if I have some kind of, of statistical estimation task or inverse problem or signal recovery or something of this type, we often ask ourselves, when is it that there's enough information in data? I want to ask myself, are there, if there are cases in which maybe there is enough information in the data, but there's computational bottlenecks that don't allow you to gather this information in full normal time. And so this is the kind of uh, program I've been, I've been uh, trying to, to take for the, the, the recently. Now today I'll talk about, you know, now, now th this path has taken me also to problems that, at least in the way that I describe them, have nothing to do with data. They're just about random combinatorial, optim random combinatorial optimization problems. By random, I mean that I have some kind of combinatorial optimization problem where the input is random, maybe a random graph, and I want to understand. Right, maybe more like data-oriented instances of this are things like community detection, in which I have some model for a graph with communities or a network with communities, and I don't understand when is it that there are either statistical or computational barriers to being able to learn such communities, right? Bisecting or clustering the graph in a meaningful way. So the talk I'll give today is a bit on that line, but I'll sort of I won't. Uh, I won't, I'll, I'll be not describing the application so on, I'll be describing sort of a fundamental combinatorial optimization problem and what we can say there. As the techniques that we develop here then turn out, they, they tend to apply in many, many different settings. And given the audience that I have in, in front of me in the, in the virtual sense, I will talk a little bit about how this can be adapted to things like uh, sparse PCA and certifying the restricted asymmetry property of matrices and things of this type, okay? But so the, the, the sort of the player for the, for, for today's talk is a deregular graph, so a random deregular graph, right? So I have a distribution that I call G and D. Can everyone see? If something is not, if you can't see anything, please uh, you know, interrupt. If you have questions, interrupt. All right, so this is a distribution of uniform, uni, sorry, uniformly drawn, uh, uniform random uh, deregular graph. On n nodes. Okay, so this is the object that we're going to talk about today. Right? So I just draw at random among all possible deregular graphs with n nodes, I pick one. Okay. And, uh, and now the problem that I'm going to be interested in is what is its chromatic number? So what is the chromatic number of the graph G? Right? So we say that, you know, let me call this phi is a coloring of the vertices of the graph. So let's say you have k colors, right? It's a coloring of G, say a graph G with k colors. Afonso, should that be a map from V to K? A what? A map from V to K? Yes. Yes, 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 you're completely right. Where do I, oh, where do I have my eraser? Good point. Just assigning to each to each vertex a color, right? With k colors, we call it usually with k colors. If for all the j an edge of the graph, they don't share. Okay, 
Okay, this is the, the classical uh, coloring problem in graph theory. And the chromatic number is simply the minimum number of colors for which there is a color, right? Is that is the minimum number of colors And now I can ask the question, if I draw G, right, if I draw graph G from this distribution, right, what is its typical coloring number? And people have been studying this for many, many decades. I mean, depending how precise you want to be, they, the, the results are from different people, but in particular, Bolivar's, I think, was the one who got uh, sort of the right asymptotic rate down to the constant. And the coloring number for G drawn, so my object G is always, for now, at least drawn uh, uniformly from this distribution. The coloring number is uh, right, so it's something like D over 2 multiplied. Okay, as in all these statements, what I mean by this, maybe I should have a little approximate. What I mean by these kinds of statements is n is going to infinity, say this over this is going to 1 or something like this, right? It's this plus or minus little o. In fact, I believe for color, you even know it that it's either like the floor of this or the ceiling of this or something of this type. Concentrate extremely well. Okay. Now, this is not what the talk is about. Well, let me take the opportunity to write to write an open problem. So before the open problem, let me just say something we can do. So a natural question that you might ask is. Okay, we know that we, the graph is colorable with this many colors, but if I actually want to color it in polynomial time, we know coloring is NP hard, but maybe for direct, for random graphs, it might not be hard, right? NP hardness is a statement about worst case hardness. Maybe for random graphs, it's actually easy. All right, and it turns out that it's relatively easy. So it's easy to color. By easy, what I mean in this talk is you can do it in polynomial time. Is it to color the vertices of G with double the, as many colors? So D over about many colors. And basically, most algorithms work. I mean, if you were to think about it for I mean, 20 minutes or something, you'll come up with an algorithm that, that colors with this many colors. And uh, well, a question. Can one do better? Okay, so it's a very natural question and the type of questions that I've been uh, interested in recently. Right, so you have this, this random graph. We know that it has a coloring with d over two log d edges. With colors, we know that we can color them if we have access to double the color, the number of colors. But is there actually some kind of computational gap here that if I ask you to color it, with uh, just d over log d, say, times 1 over 1 minus epsilon that you already can't do it quickly. And maybe this problem requires the exponential time or something like this. Right? Is this, does this correspond to some kind of computational barrier? Maybe for some of you, it will be more natural to, to, to just keep in mind that when you have a coloring, the nodes of one of the color form an independent set. And you can ask all these questions about largest size of largest independent set will look a bit like n over this. And essentially, the, what's known is basically the same thing. If you think about independent sets and you take n over the coloring number, you get essentially the same thing. Okay, But for our sake, it'll be more interesting to talk about color. OK, so is this question clear to everyone? Please interrupt if something is, is not clear. So the kind of questions that I'm interested in, or, or, or I should say, the kind of question I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different than this one. And I think it takes, it takes a minute to sort of, uh, to sort of uh, swallow this pill of what, what this question is. So, so bear with me. This is like the, probably the most important minute, which is, what if what I want to do is refute the existence of a coloring? So I give you a, a random deregular graph, and I want to, for you to give me a proof that it's not colorable with 10 colors. And I want you to do that in polynomial time. Okay, you need to give me a proof. I mean, in theory, you can even take exponential time, provided I can read the proof in polynomial time, but this doesn't really matter. Now, 
one way to right one way to exhibit such a proof is just you find a clique of size 11 right 11 nodes that all of them connect with every single one pigeonhole says you cannot color this now with 10 nodes right but maybe you can come up with more sophisticated uh, refutation algorithms right what i'm asking is given a graph right refuting coloring is basically giving a lower bound on the on the coloring number Right, you say you cannot do with this many colors or less. You need at least more than something. Right, so the computational problem I'm interested in is, given a graph drawn from a uniform distribution over a deregular graph on n nodes, what is the, low, the computational lower bound on coloring that you can give? Right, what is the best? A computational, I have them. Maybe I should call it efficient for one. Okay, so this this I think takes a second to. I mean, I can go and define it with you know, very formally in like complexity type way, but I'm, I'm not sure that's actually very useful. So I'll just try to, go ahead. Uh, so if I can convince my adversary that it was drawn from that distribution, then the fact that chi of G is D over two log D should suffice. So presumably this lower bound needs to be independent of the distribution of the graph instance. Very good, excellent. Right, this is the this is exactly the question I was hoping I was going to get to clarify. So the, your lower bound needs to needs to work regardless of the of the of the graph. In, if it's a deregular graph, your lower bound needs to work. Okay. And now you evaluate how good your lower bound is by testing it on graphs drawn from this distribution. But the lower bound needs to work always. Right, if, if the program that you write on your computer is give me a graph and I give you uh, D over two log D, I'll just build a deregular graph that is very different, that has a much, that it can be colored with, I build a bipartite graph, graph say, that actually is too colorable, and your algorithm will give something that's not a lower bound. Your algorithm needs to always be correct. Now, if you had a way of knowing if the graph is typical or not, you could just say like D plus one, if, because right, the deregular graph is always d plus one colorable. So you could just say d plus one if your graph looks weird, and you could actually say d over two log d if the graph doesn't look weird. The problem is how do you tell if the graph looks weird or not, right? It's just like, what does it even mean for the graph to be weird, right? So the question is about the same way that he, you can think of this as giving an upper bound, a computational upper bound on coloring, I'm interested in the lower bound. Okay, is now the setting clear? Right, your program needs to output always, always a lower bound, okay? and you evaluate it how well it does on random graphs, okay? Okay, so how do we, right, so how do we go about, I mean, I'm gonna show you a lower bound, right? So the way, the best way of thinking about this, I mean, this lower bound is, is from 1970 due to Hoffman, but the best way to think about this lower bound is in terms of cuts. Right, what is, if, when I say that I can color my graph with K colors, basically what I mean is that I can, I can do a partition of the vertices in K subsets in a way that every single wedge edge gets cut by this partition. Right. So it's exactly the same as saying that the maximum K cut is all of the edges. All right, so, so let's, let's rewrite things in that way. Maybe, okay. Maybe I'll keep this fellow up and that one. Okay. okay, so given a graph, let's define the maximum K cut of the graph or fractional maximum K cut, right? So given a graph G, I call the maximum K cut of G equal to the maximum over all uh, possible uh, the colorings of partitions, right? You can think of it now as a K partition of the nodes. Okay. 
And this will be the fraction of edges that get cut. So the number of edges i j edges of the graph such that i, I is different than j, uh, sigma i is different than sigma j over the total number of edges. And basically, you know, g is k tolerable if and only if uh, m k m c k of g is equal to one. If you can cut every single edge with a k partition, then you can color it. If not, then you can't. Right? It's completely good. Right? So upper bounds. Right? Maybe it's worth writing this out. Upper bounds. Way of MCK give lower bounds in color. Is this clear to everyone? If I can upper bound the maximum K cut, then effectively I lower bound the chromatic number. So how do we, you know, how do we upper bound the maximum cut? So maybe I'll leave this, I'll put it here, because you know, when I, it'll be nice for the punchline to have the, the number when I talk about what, how well you can uh, refute. Okay, so how do we upper bound MCK? And there's basically a spectral argument. It's a spectral upper bound. Okay, this is due to this is a theorem of Hoffman in uh, 1970. Okay, and now let's see that. I, let's see if I can make uh, no mistake on the fly. So take a partition. This is the only. This is the only actual proof I'm going to show. The rest I'm going to sort of uh, wave my hands a bit here. I'll uh, I'll actually show you the proof of this. It's very nice. Okay, take a partition, and now take a matrix. Take a matrix P. Write this matrix as n by n. And now I build P the following way. Ij is is the gram matrix of the indicators of the you know it's like it will be the gram matrix of the indicators of the partition where the indicators are pushed to be in the simplex so they sort of have mean zero okay for those of you that you know like frames and so on this will be a very familiar object uh and minus one over k minus one if Okay, this is just a gram matrix of the of the of the of the, the the vectors that for each one of the vertices I correspond to one point in the simplex on the k simplex. Okay, I had something show up on my screen. Okay. So okay, all I need about this matrix is that P is positive semi definite. Well, I'm gonna need what it is too, but uh, I think for you know for an audience who likes string theory a lot, this will be something that I don't have to prove, right? This is just a gram matrix of some very explicit construction. And so of course it's positive sign left in. Okay, so let's take lambda min of A just to be the minimum eigenvalue of A. Right? So maybe it's worth saying that where A is the adjacency matrix. Right? So A is fine. So what I mean by this, it's an n by n matrix where entry ij gets an, gets a one if the nodes are connected. Okay. And now this is an this is basically we're going to upper bound the maximum k cut via the minimum eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. Okay, it's good to I mean it's good maybe to remember that this guy is negative, right? Because the adjacency matrix has zeros in the diagonal, so it has trace zeros, so the minimum eigenvalue is for sure negative. Okay. Now because this is a positive semi-definite. We have that, you know, if I think the inner product between two, the, the, the Hilbert Schmidt inner product between two positive and every matrices, it's positive. All right, so I can take between P and A minus lambda min of A, I want to keep writing it, times identity. This inner product is positive, or non negative at least. All right? Okay. If anything is not clear, or if you think I'm going too slow, you know, interrupt me too. Okay, so this is equal to what? 
this is equal to P A minus lambda min times the inner product between P and the identity. Right? But that inner product is easy to work out because at the diagonal of P, right? I mean, this is a gram matrix of unit norm vectors, so it's just one. So the trace of P is N. Right, but another way to see it is the vertices, like the vertex itself, I, uh, sigma I is, of course, the same as sigma. Okay, now what is this one? Okay, so what we get here, we get, we get uh, basically, right, so if, if A has an edge between I and J, I pick up either one if they are in the same partition, or I pick up minus one over K minus one if they're not. I actually pick up two times that, right? Because I picked the ij and the minus ij, right? So I pick up twice the number of edges not cut, then minus uh, twice over k minus one times the edges cut, right? Can you still see, or am I going a bit too small? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to close now this. Okay, so now what do I have? I have that zero is big or equal than, right? Two times the edge is not cut. So this is twice times you know, number of edges, one minus the fraction of edges that get cut. I mean, I'm here. I'm abusing notation of it. I'm pretending already that sigma is the one that achieves the maximum cut, right? Let me say, say achieving maximum. It doesn't really matter. It's just so that I don't have to introduce other notation. All right, minus uh, twice uh, over k minus one uh, times the edges that are cut, which is exactly the number of edges times the fraction of them that are cut, right? Uh, minus lambda min n. Okay, so now let's just, you know, work this out. So let's divide by 2e on the other side. So I get 0, 1 minus mc k. I'll drop the g, minus 2 over k minus 1. Oh, there's a 2, sorry. 2. No, let's divide by 2 as well. Okay, I'll divide by 2e. I'll divide the whole thing by 2e. Uh, minus n, n over 2. Okay, so far so good. Now what is this? Any takers? D regular graph, so this is just one over D. Right? The number of edges is like N times D over two, because right, each, each node sees half an edge, so you need to divide by two. Okay, so this is one over D. So what do I have on the other side? Uh, so here I have, uh, okay, uh, let, me, let me do this a bit more carefully. So I have M one plus one over K minus one. MCK, right? I'm just moving MCK to that side. The smaller equal than one minus one over D. Oh, and uh, over D. Right? And this is just K minus one uh, plus one. So, right? This is just K. K minus one plus one is K. K minus one is K. Right? This K over K minus one is what this is. I'm just going to divide it on the other end so that I don't need another line. So, okay, this was the only proof or like algebra that I'm going to do. Okay, so this is known as the Hoffman power. So this is the kind of thing that I'm uh, that I'm saying as a, as an upper bound on the cut, which will be a lower bound on the chromatic number, right? Which is that if you give if I give you a graph, you could just take the minimum eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix, 
And this would be an actual upper bound of the maximum cut. If this guy happens to be smaller than one, you did prove to me that there is no color. Right? This is like an effective algorithm. It's efficient because computing eigenvalues is efficient. And, uh, and now we have to see how well it does. Right? So now we build our program that is able to certify, and we have to see how good it is. Right? So basically, what we need to answer now to see how good it is with high probability or an expectation or something of the kind, we need to ask ourselves, what is the typical value of the minimum eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix of a, a random deregular graph? Right? This is now the question that we need to answer. Luckily, this question has been answered for us. And due to a theorem of Friedman, O3 tells us that if G is drawn, you know, d random deregular graphs, then the minimum value of A is basically uh, minus 2 square root of D minus 1 plus little o of 1. Okay, and most of the times I won't, be, I'll ignore little o of 1, so as n goes to infinity, it's going to 0. Okay? So, so we know that, you know, the bound, this bound we just derived will give this, and so if we, this means that effectively the upper bound that we get, maybe I'll do it a bit higher to get a bit more room, mck of g, right, you get an upper bound that looks like k minus 1 over k times 1 plus, right, minus with minus 2 root d minus 1 over d. Now, I want you to look at this expression, right, and notice that, okay, first of all, maybe something I should have said before. If I don't try to optimize the maximum cut, and I just give, I just pick an assignment completely at random, right, on average, the number of edges I'm going to cut is exactly k minus 1 over k of the total edges, right, because for each node, the, it's connected, you know, 1 over k of the edges are connected to their own community, 1 over k to all the other ones. Right, so on average, you're going to cut k minus 1 over k. So if I don't put anything here, this is just the value of the, of the typical cut. If I don't optimize. Right, so this is really counting how much I can optimize. And it's normalized in this way. Right, if I have 1 plus 0, I'm just getting sort of the completely random average cut. Okay. So, okay, so what does this say for coloring? So what about coloring? What does this say for coloring? Not, not to serve as a pen or something, but I feel like there's a lot of, I'll use colors for this. So what does it say, right? So we just need to make this bound equal to one, right? We just need to make, uh, you know, I'm gonna write it this way. You just need to make this equal to one. So we're at one minus one over k, one plus uh, two, and I, I mean, I'll ignore this minus one. The kind of resolution that we're looking at things is the matter. Right, little low factors I'm not too worried about. Okay, so roughly, right, this means that roughly you can bound, right, you can bound the maximum k cut away from one exactly when k looks a bit like uh, square root d over two. Okay, if I didn't uh, do anything wrong, this should be done. Okay, so what does this mean? While the coloring number is d over two log d, the, the, you know, the efficient upper bound, or efficient lower bound, uh, lower bound, okay? this is a huge gap, right? So the right number is like d over log d. However, I can certify, I can give you a refutation, give you a proof, that you cannot color it with less than square root d over 2. But from square root d over 2 to d over 2 log d, there's a huge, huge gap. Right? So now what I want to give, what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk is to, 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 to explain and try to convince you of, or explain how we, we try to argue of if there is actually a computational barrier that doesn't let you go past this. And I'll convince you, I'll try to convince you that this is actually fundamental. And, and try to explain how we do something like this. Okay, but this is a good time, I guess it's also half the time, it's a very good time to stop in case there's questions. 
So what I'm going to try and argue now, it's, I mean, as with everything with computational hardness, I won't prove it. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give rigorous evidence for it based in some kind of conjecture, but, but okay, rigorous evidence nonetheless, but it won't be a proof. But I'll give you evidence that that actually there's a fundamental there's a fundamental barrier here, and I believe I think a few of us believe that there is no polynomial time algorithm that is capable of giving a certificate better than screw the over two. So Alfonso, you said you're entertaining questions. Do you have intuition uh, beyond this rigorous evidence you're about to show us that uh, um, Huffman can't be improved with like just Lovash? Ah, good, very good. Wow. It's just the, the good questions is coming. So, okay, so why it can't be improved in, say, general? It, we, we see over and over again examples of which this, the spectral bound, and in a way the Hoffman here is the spectral bound, cannot be improved. And we see many, many instances of that. Uh, why Lovas can't improve, uh, this is actually, okay, was going to be my next sentence, which is that it's a very natural thing to try. Instead of Hoffman to use something like the Lovas theta function. And uh, uh, one of my collaborators on this, Jess Banks, with a few other collaborators, has, uh, has shown that, uh, that Lovas theta function doesn't improve. Or maybe it has some improvement on a little low of uh, 1 over d or something. But certainly not in the scale. But right, this would be the natural question. The other, after that, it would be what about higher levels of the sun squares hierarchy or something? This is a bit harder to, to answer. But we have, I mean, one of our rigorous evidence is, is of the style of the sum of squares type, type to lower bound. Uh, let me just say that and then I'll say a bit more. Okay, so now let me ask a question you know, to the audience, which is how would I go about arguing something like this? So, of course, one way is what, what Dustin is suggesting, which is that you know, I just try to find uh, better algorithms and I try to find some kind of like algorithms I believe are very good, maybe an arc of algorithms such as the sum of squares of which the lower state of function is part of. And I try to try to show that that doesn't work, right? And this sort of gives me confidence. But what is another like conceptual way of trying to argue that I cannot certify better than that? Okay. And I think it's worth taking you know thirty seconds to see what uh, you know to, for to think about this. How would you? How can I convince you that indeed there is a fundamental barrier there? Uh, you can reduce to a thing that I already believe has a barrier, like maybe hidden click or something. Yeah, I could. I'm not going to do that. I could. But, but in, in your sentence, there was a word that was key, which was hidden. Right. One thing I could do, and it's exactly how you, the, the reason why you're convinced that hidden click is, has a gap of this type is that someone is able to hide a click and argue that you can find it. This is exactly what we're going to do here. Right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a distribution of graphs that is, of course, very different from you know, the uniform distribution over deregular graphs. It's a distribution, of course, over deregular graphs still. And it's a distribution for which the coloring number is essentially this one. So I'm planting, you know, I'm hiding a coloring with very few colors compared to the right number of colors. And I'm going to argue that if I give you a sample from this distribution, a graph that was drawn from this distribution, and the graph that was drawn from actually the uniform distribution on the regular graphs, I'm going to argue that you won't be able to tell the difference unless you spend exponential time on it, or a super polynomial at least. Okay. So this is the key, the key idea, is to try to argue that it's, hard, that it's hard to refute something or to give bounds on something by constructing sort of a tempered distribution of objects for which what you want to prove is there is not, or what you want to prove is not there is there, and try to argue that these objects are indistinguishable in bounded computational time. And I won't talk a lot about how we argue that things are indistinguishable. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief there, but I'll talk a little bit about the construction because that's also interesting. Talking about the actual heuristics of how to argue indistinguishability would be a whole other talk that uh, I couldn't describe graphs very much. We'd have to go straight to that. Okay, so what is a natural 
Okay, so let, let's see if I can keep this, uh, this interaction going. So how would I build, what would be the natural way of building a distribution of graphs that has a small coloring like this? Right, so I want to build a distribution of graphs that, that is k-colorable for some k. Right. What would be a natural way of doing it? How, what would be a natural way of doing this? It could be like k regular or something, right? So I have, what do you mean by k regular? Regular with sufficiently small k or maybe bipartite or something? No, but they need to be, right? I want the graph to be indistinguishable from the other one. If the degrees are different, then it's very easy to distinguish. Right, so I want it to look like a, like a legitimately uniformly drawn irregular graph as much as possible. Uh, so maybe you plant a coloring and then you uh, draw edges randomly. Perfect. Right, so I take a coloring. Uh, this, uh, okay, so perfect. I take a coloring. Let me see if I get the construction. So I pick uh, an assignment, like an assignment. I'm not going to call it a coloring because I'll, I'll, I'll describe more things in terms of the cuts because they're a little more uh, less brittle than the colorings, but uh, everything translates to coloring. I will translate it and then draw right to this and then draw the regular graph. Like condition. On the number of edges, I mean, right, let me do the construction, make sure I do the construction properly. So the number of edges uh, cut with this assignment, right, it's assignment of key colors. And over the total number of edges is equal to, right, is equal to the cuts that I want to make sure it's there. Right, and so I'm going to parameterize. This will feel strange, but it's for historic reasons. If I do it any other way, then if, you, if you, any of you is interested and goes to the cup, the, the signs will all be fixed. Okay, like traditionally, when you're trying to plant empty community structure, use a negative, uh, a negative, um, yeah, parameter. Okay, but so think of eta, right? In particular, think of eta as being between you know, zero, where you're not planting anything. And uh, minus one over k minus one, in which you're planting a color. It's just this is a little bit less brittle to 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 work with. Okay, so I'm going to pick sigma, and I'm going to draw the regular graph condition on that particular partition getting a cut. That's what I want. If I want a coloring, I'll ask for the fractional cut to be one. If I don't want to, like, if I want to just have a completely typical type thing, I ask for this to be zero, and I get the typical cut. I mean, the distribution will still maybe be a little different because I'm conditioning on it being typical for sure, right? But it's similar. And in between, I'm doing other things. Right? So, so this is a natural, this is a natural distribution for me to try to, to trick you with, right? I draw something from here and I ask now for which values of eta and k can I get away with drawing this and this not being distinguishable from the normal uniformly drawn irregular graph. Okay, so this is known. This is known as the the vertex, like the regular stochastic block model. For those of you that know the stochastic block model, this is essentially the same object. It's just that it's just that object for uh, for deregular graphs rather than irregular graphs. It's a complete analog. So let me draw it with G N D K eta S P M. Now I have I can draw G prime from here. Right. This is uh, this is a model studied, uh, you know, maybe traditionally more in physics, but to model community structure. Right. In community structure, usually you think of eta as being positive. You want to cut less edges because people tend to be more connected in their own community. Here, the goal, the, you know, I, I want to take eta negative, but uh, it's completely all the all is the same. Okay. So now I can ask the, the type of questions that people ask uh, themselves you know, when, when, they, when they come up with these objects and these distributions that people ask themselves in community detection and so on, is the following, for which value, so right, for which values of 
uh, k, right? I mean, m, d, and k, but let's say d, n is going to infinity, d, k, and eta uh, is, can one distinguish? G drawn from this uniform D regular graph or G prime and drawn from this SVN. Usually the question that gets asked is not if whether one can distinguish, but more so whether um, uh, whether you can recover the partition. Whether from a draw of this you can learn something about the assignment that I picked. Right, that's sort of the problem that, that makes more sense, but these problems, at least in this case, tend to be, tend to be the same. Okay, so there is sort of formal evidence. By formal evidence, I mean, you know, rigorous calculations, but, they're, but they don't provide, you know, there's not a theorem, because what I'm about to say is that for a certain range of parameters, it's believed that it takes more than polynomial time to distinguish a sample from one from a sample to the other even when they are completely different in the sense that this cut that I'm planting here does not exist in this distribution. So if I look at the maximum kick cut of this and the maximum kick cut of that, I get two different, uh, I get two very different values. So this would be a, a test that I could use to distinguish, but, it's, but this test is not a test that I can in general uh, compute in polynomial time. Okay? And so this is known as the, the keston stegen Threshold. I never remember how to spell Kesten Stegen, so I will see if I can. Uh, Kesten. This comes from physics. So the Kesten Stegen threshold basically it says that. Uh, distinguishing between these is hard if. Uh, D is smaller than what's known as the keston stegen threshold for the stochastic model. Right, it's a function of eta and is equal to one minus. Yeah, and this is normalized in a way that it already doesn't depend on k by this point. Okay, so you get this. So what does this mean? Okay, so, so let's see if we can, uh, maybe it's a good, a good time to take a step back. Okay, so I follow the suggestion that Dustin gave that I pick the coloring and I take, I took the model condition on that being, uh, being a coloring or that particular assignment having a large cut, right? I choose a large cut just to not be as brittle. And then I, I, I have, this is the distribution that, that Dustin suggested, I mean, a, a little modified. And this is the regular distribution. And this work that comes from, from statistical physics argues that if D is smaller than this threshold, one over eta squared plus one, then distinguishing between these two distributions is hard. I can say, maybe I'll take the opportunity now to just for a couple of minutes describe how one argues things of this type. So th there's a few different ways. The way that it's argued here is by basically, in a way is arguing that things similar to belief propagation will not be able to recover the right partitioning when applied on this graph. And there's, there's sort of many empirical reasons to believe that once that doesn't work, sort of nothing works. And, and yeah. so it's, now there's other type of heuristics that I'll describe in a bit that also end up predicting the same thing. Okay. So now if we see, okay, what does this give us? Right, what is the value of the cut? This means that, you know, I can have a maximum k cut of, of one of these g primes drawn from this distribution while it's still being hard to distinguish, right? That has a cut that is at least, right? I can just replace D by this. Okay, if you work it out, right? it's one plus, and now I get, right? The cut of this is K minus one over K one minus uh, eta. So I just have to work out what this is. Right, I get d minus one, I get that a is one over square root of d minus one. So right at the threshold where it starts being hard or easy to distinguish these two models, the cut, the maximum k cut that g prime has is k minus one over k, one plus one over square root d minus one. So what this means is that for, it, for a random D regular graph, it's hard to certify an upper bound on the maximum K cut that's better than this. 
because this distribution that uh, Dustin suggested will have a cut that's of that size and we believe that they're computationally indistinguishable. Okay, so what does that mean for, for uh, right? What does this mean for, uh, for coloring? Okay, so I guess I'm gonna, how much time do I have, Dustin? Uh, let's say uh, five or so minutes. Okay, all right, so I have to hurry. So what does this tell us for cut, for coloring, right? For coloring, I have to put that bound being equal to one, right? To put this bound equal to one, I basically have one minus one over K and one plus one over square T. So I get something like, right? I get something like uh, being uh, square root T. Okay, so what I mean by this is, this is not a, a computationally efficient lower bound. This is an argument that getting a lower bound better than this should be difficult. Okay, because I can do a quiet planting, or maybe I should, you know, just to not confuse, maybe I should use this notation. So I can build a distribution G prime that has a coloring number of square root D, and for which I believe that, uh, that it's hard to distinguish between uh, between these two distributions. And so I've convinced you, hopefully, I mean, if you believe in these conjectures, that one cannot do better than, uh, than square root t. But there's still a gap, right? And it might not look like much. But, uh, but actually, it turns out that improving from square root t to square root t over 2 is, is quite, yeah, it requires a quite an interesting uh, uh, construction. So I'm realizing that I might not have time to to give you the construction. Let's see, with five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll convince you, I'll explain how we do it without giving the construction. So, okay, may, maybe before this, let me say that we can come up with an L distribution that is quieter than this distribution that, uh, that is sort of the most, the most obvious way of planting a coloring. Right, we can come up with another distribution that can go can have a much smaller coloring while still being computationally quiet. You cannot still cannot tell that I sort of tampered with the distribution. It still looks like uniformly uh, given the regular graph. Okay. So now the question is, how do we make this more quiet? And the main, I mean, an intuitive sense, what's okay? There's two ways. Maybe one way to think about it intuitively is that conditioning in this way is easy to understand and easy to do on the computer. Right? But this is not the right conditioning, right? Maybe the right conditioning would be something like condition on the deregular graph having a coloring or having a big cut. This is not necessarily the same as fixing a cut and then conditioning on that cut, right? And this is one of the places where the issue comes from. But arguing about the other conditional distribution, saying anything about it is, is usually very, very difficult, okay? So in order to motivate the construction that we do, it's worth going to, to the case of k equals two. Okay, so I'm going to take k equals 2. Okay, and I'm going to ask what is the maximum fractional number of edges that can be cut with just picking 2, right? Just a normal, what we call a cut usually in a graph. Okay, and so the Hoffman bound here gives that mc2 of a regular graph is small or equal, if we translate what Hoffman, Hoffman bound is here, one half plus, and it's exactly square root d minus one over d. Okay. While, uh, right, while this SVM construction, sort of the SVM construction, basically gets shy of a factor of two here. Right, it's something like MC2, you know, the distribution of, over graphs that looks like a random uniform derivative graph, but it's not, getting something like one half plus uh, one over two square root two. Okay, it's shy by a factor of two just like above. Okay. So now, it will be hard for me to argue this properly, but the maximum k cut, you know, if you think about what the cut is, you, if you've seen uh, some kind of spectral clustering or algorithms of this type, spectral algorithms for graphs, you see that it looks a lot like maximizing a quadratic form over the hypercube on the adjacency matrix, or maybe on minus the adjacency matrix or something of this type. Right, and so there's a theorem due to, to, to Amir Dembo and Raymond Tenari and Sirobat Sen from maybe three years ago, that says that the maximum, they, they have a theorem saying that the maximum k cut of the, of, uh, of the D regular graph 
It looks like a half, right? This is sort of half the edges. You're going to cut with a random cut. Plus, and the right number here is this P star that comes from statistical physics. I'll say a few words about it. Square root E plus O little o of 1 over square root T. So why is this, why does this matter? Is what is this P star? So P star is a number that's meaningful in, in statistical physics, the so-called the Parisi constant. And it describes the ground state of the of the of the SK model, the Sheraton Kirkpatrick model. Right? And so you can basically think of it as P star is the value of the following. So take a Gaussian matrix within, with standard Gaussian entries. And now take, maximize the quadratic form of it by taking the leading eigenvalue. But do it not over the sphere, but over the hypercube. Right, and I'm dividing by, let me put the two here. I'm dividing by three halves, by n to the three halves, because basically, right, this guy is norm square n, this guy is norm square n, and this guy is norm square n, so this is how this becomes a number. Okay, so now, this is so-called the sheraton kirkpatrick Hamiltonian. I mean, usually you think of min rather than max, but of course, this is doubly symmetric. This is all the same. Okay, and basically, if you were to try to understand what the typical max cut is with some like empirical process theory or something like this, and if at some point, you know, it will be like the number of no, total number of edges and then plus something that looks like minimum of x transpose a minus the total number of edges or expected value of a x, and if you say, okay, let me just pretend this is a Gaussian with the right mean and variance, you would come up with some heuristic and the heuristic would be exactly this because you would replace by the Gaussian in this way. And basically what, what uh, Dembo, uh, Montanari, and Sen show is that this heuristic is correct uh, to all other things. Okay. So now, now the thing is that we can then think about whether you can certify an upper bound of this, so P star, is something like uh, 0 0.7. Okay. Now, if I relax from the hypercube to the sphere, right, then the spectral norm of the Wigner matrix, you know, is 2. So a good, a good upper bound, like computational upper bound, given a matrix W, is an upper bound of 2, right, which corresponds to replacing the P star by 1. And, and in fact, right, it's sort of the profound that we believe is the right one, right, which is replacing this P star by one. And so this problem is similar, at least in spirit, to trying to show that it's computationally hard to argue that the value of this is smaller than two. Okay, this may be a little fast. And now we can ask, how do I plant a point in the upper cube right, at the spectrum, at the top of the spectrum of W? And this is something that I did with uh, with uh, Dimitri Kuniski and, and Alex Wine maybe a year ago, and uh, we are also in the, in the, involved in the things I'm trying together with Chris Moore and Jess Banks. And basically, the, the sort of the subtle thing is if you do the same kind of conditioning, okay, now, now it's more for the experts, if there's any, I'll be very brief. If you do the kind of conditioning that we did there, what you're doing is essentially a spike model, in which I take a Gaussian matrix plus a spike, I pick an hypercube point, and I take a Gaussian matrix plus XX transpose on the hypercube, because then when I take that inner product, I get the value that I want on that rank one part. But it's known that there's this push out phenomena in the spectrum of random matrices in the, in, when I have spike models. So even though you only put a, a value, uh, say a value, only plant a value of say two, actually the leading eigenvalue of the matrix ends up being what you plant plus over one, plus one over that. So it's when you get, when you plant two, you get 2.5. And so if you plant something, it starts showing up much more as an eigenvalue. There's some eigenvalue that pops out of the support. And intuitively, that's what's happening in the stochastic block model, is when we try to plant a large coloring, a large cut or a small coloring, that you're planting it in a way that something pushes out of the spectrum on the other side, very much like how it happens in the so-called BVP transition. And so what you have to do is you have to plant in a way that you don't allow for this push out to happen. And so what you do is you plant 
Essentially, you plant an eigenvector. You make it, make it completely orthogonal to all the other eigenvectors. Right here, you can just rotate the spectrum to have a point in the hypercube on the top. On the, on the deregular graphs, you can't just rotate the spectrum because otherwise it's not a graph. But we plant a version of the stochastic block model that's so-called equitable. And basically, it's a much, much more structured version in which each vertex not only has D nodes, but actually each vertex has exactly the same number of, no of connections to each one of the other communities. So it's a much more rigid construction. But it so happens that that construction ends up being an eigenvector. I mean, the, the thing you plant ends up being an eigenvector. And so this push out phenomena that's typical in random matrix theory is not present anymore. And this was the, the reason for it to be easy to detect. And so we have lots of evidence based on like hierarchies of STPs and this VP analysis and something called the low degree method that that construction goes all the way to square root P over two. Okay, so I realized this end was, uh, there was some interesting random matrix theory that, uh, you know, by virtue of showing Hoffman's bound, I didn't have time to say, but hopefully for those of you that know what the spike model is, this makes some sense and I'm happy to answer any questions and, and go into more detail. And uh, if anyone asks me, I can talk a bit about RRP too. Sorry for, uh, for already going a bit over time. Oh, great. Thank you. So there's a reaction icon. You can, you can click the clap or the thumbs up or maybe do an audible clap. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.